Good, good morning. Uh, for those of you who uh, missed yesterday, my name is James. It's, it's really good to uh, have you here. Um, I am the director of the Almeida Initiative. We're a ministry in Seattle. We train Christians on how to uh, make Muslim friends and have meaningful conversations with those friends. Um, so yesterday, we kind of got into the sort of basics of the Islamic worldview and how it uh, relates to Muslims living around us. And today, I want to try and get really practical as far as how you can actually uh, put this into practice where you live. Um, so I'm going to break this down to sort of three basic sections here. Um, first is how to meet Muslims. The second is how to have meaningful conversations with Muslims. Uh, welcoming, And then the third is welcoming Muslims into the life of the church. Um, you guys were a great audience yesterday. You were all really encouraging, and it probably went to my head, and it probably means I'll go over on time here. Uh, I'll try not to. Um, so, so how to meet Muslims, right? So we're here in this room. There's Muslims out there somewhere, and how do we go from knowing about Islam and Muslims to actually meeting people? So um, first thing I want to help us think through is how to have the right mindset for this. Uh, and Psalm 72, uh, verse 8 to 11, said, talking about the reign of the Messiah, says, May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him and all nations serve him. So question, does anybody know where Sheba and Seba are? Yemen. Uh, yeah, Yemen, right? Um, Tarshish, no one quite knows, could be Tarsus in Turkey, could be uh, Carthage in Tunisia. You know, uh, either way, right, everywhere that's like directly named in this map of the Messiah's kingdom is currently a Muslim country, right? Um, so we should, all, all nations are mentioned here. But these, this specific region is named specifically, right? So we should look at a map of the Middle East and not see a threat. We should see somewhere where Jesus' kingdom is going to have dominion in a way that's actually named in the psalm, right? That should be in our mindset here. Uh, so the, the only question is, are we going to participate in this opportunity? Or are we going to you know, wait for someone else to participate in this opportunity? Um, And then, you know, for a sort of local individual level, um, Hebrews 13.2 says, uh, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So, uh, now, whether or not the people you're interacting with are going to be angels or not, uh, I think the, the real point here is that when we show hospitality to people, as we welcome outsiders, as we meet people who don't belong to our number, uh, we, we should have an expectation that God is going to show up in magical ways. And that's been pretty consistently my experience reaching out to the Muslim world. Um, and, that, and that's what I want for you guys, right? I'm not here to say, look at all these people in need and you guys need to go out there and do stuff and you should feel guilty for not going out there. No. I'm telling you, if you partake in this, you're going to have so much fun. You're going to have adventures. You're going to see God show up in some uh, amazing ways. Um, so with that in mind, right, there are sort of um, three places to kind of get started. And I'm breaking these up into intentional opportunities, uh, natural opportunities, and supernatural opportunities. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by all those, right? So an intentional opportunities is I don't know any Muslims. I'm going to go and find Muslims to talk to. Uh, so, so where can I do that, right? So the first type you could go to, you could find a religious gathering you could go to, right? So perhaps the local mosque has like an interfaith night that they're inviting their neighbors to, which you could show up at, right? Maybe there's a Muslim student association at the University of Idaho somebody could go to. Um, it's not necessarily the best place to start, but that's exactly how I got started. I just crashed a Muslim Student Association meeting and then just kept going. Um, in fact, that 
ended up um, escalating uh, significantly. Um, so after going for a few years in 2014, I was invited, they hosted a specific interfaith dialogue event, right? And, and usually these things are painfully shallow, but by the grace of God, this one had a terrible turnout. Ends up being me and five Muslims in a room for an hour and a half. The people who like planned the thing didn't bother to show up to it. So they had this like whole curriculum planned out that was you know as vanilla as possible. Like how can we all be Americans together when I'm not, uh, and most of them weren't either. So they just you know so after you know 30 seconds of looking at the question, somebody said, "So how can you believe Jesus is God and man at the same time?" It's like, uh, and how can you trust the Bible hasn't been corrupted after 2,000 years? And after answering those questions, uh, th this one girl said. You know, I really want to go to church sometime, but my Christian friend never invites me. So I said, what? My wife and I go, come with us. In fact, you guys should all come, make it like an interfaith field trip. <laughs> uh, and, and they were like, um, you know, and they were like, oh yeah, sounds good. Was, was honestly expecting nothing to happen. But three days later on Facebook, I got the following notification for an event. Uh, it says, MSA goes to church. <laughs> this, this is verbatim what they said. Salam alaikum, guys. Guess what happens on Sunday? Church! <laughs> Our very own James Raymond, who frequents the IH, has invited us to visit his church with him. This is a fantastic opportunity to learn about other faiths and how they're practiced around us. We'll get lunch afterwards, come hungry. Parking will be validated. And, and so this results in the, the, the official MSA Facebook page inviting 1.3 thousand Muslims <laughs> on Facebook, and we, have, and we have 50 people RSVP. Now, this is a college RSVP, right? So that doesn't uh, you know, mean anything in real life, but we have, um, you know, we have 13 people show up to church that Sunday you know, for, from that event, and we went to lunch afterwards, and we had you know, really, really good conversations. So, so um, that, you know, that happened by going to this you know, interfaith religious event that was on their calendar, and these things exist, right? Um, what you're going to find in the Muslim community is that they're actually hungry to have interactions with other religions, not, mo not mostly because they're trying to convert other people to Islam, but because Muslims in America are in this mindset that we're under threat, right? And that we want to prove to everyone that we're not terrorists and that we're valuable members of society, and because of that, they're very, very excited to get together with, with other people who are willing to see them as human beings, right? So this is an opportunity for us to meet people. Um, then you have cultural events, right? So maybe you have, you know, maybe there's like a Persian New Year happening or something during Ramadan or, you know, a stand-up comedy show or a music night or something where people from that community gather. Those are really, really easy ways to get... Um, get plugged in with these things. Because again, these are about culture, not about religion. So I had great conversations by going and seeing an Arab stand-up comic. Um, by getting involved in the, I actually managed to get on the board of the Seattle Arab Festival now. Um, it was just, you know, it, it, because they, they need help planning things. So um, again, they know who I am. They know about the Almeida Initiative. I'm not hiding who I am. I've never had to hide who I am. I've never had to hide the fact that I'm a Bible-believing Christian, but I keep getting invited to stuff. Um, and, then, um, so, and then finally, there's kind of third places, right? Figuring out where people like hang out, right? So maybe it's a restaurant that serves halal food. I don't know if you have those around here. There's probably not many. If there's any, they'll, they'll be there. Um, or, you know, a coffee shop that stays open late, like uh, Bootsers. I, you know, I went there, the second time I went there, I met two Saudis there. So just have open eyes in these third places that are not work, that are not home, where people hang out and just sort of keep open eyes, right? So you can intentionally spend time in places like that, working for an afternoon or something, and that will generate opportunities to meet people. Um, then you have natural opportunities, right? This would be a neighbor living down the street, uh, somebody across the apartment complex, uh, somebody you work with, um, somebody you commute with, somebody you just sort of meet in the course of your day-to-day -day life. And the question is, how do you go from general acknowledgements of their existence to actual relationship? So it's simple. Now, maybe you guys know this because you're a small town. In Seattle, I have to explain how to say hi to people. <laughs> um, but it, it's, again, it's, it's, 
it's just normal, right? So you can say, um, hey, I've been meaning to say hi to you guys for a while now. How is the neighborhood treating you? Um, hey, are you guys new to the neighborhood? If you're feeling brave, you can say, salam alaikum. Uh, all it means is peace be upon you. It's nothing, nothing super weird. Or, you know, you could gamble and guess their ethnicity, right? It's not a good idea, but I do it, and it works for me. Um, <laughs> you know, most of the time, right? <laughs> sometimes I like, sometimes we're like, hey, anti Tuffy, out of me? It's like, what? You speak Arabic? It's like, no, I'm Indian. Oh, sorry, I'm going to find a different neighborhood now. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, you, you, can, you, can ha you can have fun with it, right? To take some risks. It's, live a little. Um, where is he? And then, uh, you, then once you've kind of broke ground, how do you follow up? Again, it's, it's, it's simple. Like, um, I would love to have you guys over for dinner sometime. I will make sure that we provide food that you can eat. So you can figure that out, right? You know, maybe you buy halal meat. If you're not comfortable with that, you can buy seafood, which they don't care about. Um, there's all sorts of ways to do it, but the acknowledgement of, hey, I'll, I'll make sure that you can eat our food, right? That we, that we cater to that. Um, or a few of us are having a barbecue. Would you like some food? Um, or you want to be brave again, you could just say, I realized recently I don't know any Muslims and would love to get to know you, right? It's on the nose, but it'll probably work. You know, or, you know, you work with a Muslim and you want to say hi, you'd say, hey, we've worked together for a while now. I'd love to get to know you more. Want to get coffee next Wednesday. Uh, again, it's like a, just something I found that if you say, let's get coffee sometime, it's like, sure, maybe in six months, right? Whereas if it's like next Wednesday, oh, I can't do that. How about Friday, right? It's, it's just, a, just a trick of the trade. Um, or another friend and I are going hiking later this week. Do you want to join us? Or, hey, since we're both religious people in a secular company, we should get lunch sometime and compare notes, right? There's lots of ways to just sort of break the ice and start getting to know people that people are going to be open to. Um, and then finally, we have uh, supernatural opportunities. Um, and, and so what I, what I mean by that isn't necessarily, um, you know, you see this, you know, the sky opens and a finger points down and says this person. Um, wh what I'm talking about is things that you can't plan for, but God will put in your path. Um, and the way you, uh, and the way you kind of, um, and, and the, what, what I found, so for example, right, um, uh, that's, a, that's a little too out there. I'll, I'll tell you that one later. Um, <laughs> so the first, is, so there's sort of three keys to this, right? The first is you ask God for open eyes. You believe that God has you in this city, this town, this state for a reason. And you ask him for open eyes for the people he'd have you talk to. Um, and then second, be pre prepared to courageously walk through the doors that God opens and actually go through those. Um, and then three, build some margin in your life, right? And, and so, so what, I, what I mean by that is it's easy to get so busy that we don't have the time to respond to opportunities that present themselves. Um, so perhaps, you know, perhaps you, you know, two of you are having a meeting at work that's about something that's not specifically sensitive, and instead of uh, doing your meeting in the office, you go meet in a coffee shop. Um, and perhaps you plan this every Wednesday afternoon and you tell your wives, hey, so um, you know, Wednesday is open eyes for evangelism day and we're prepared to, <coughs> we're preparing to, we're preparing for God to send us people, which means that our Wednesday night schedule might get disrupted a bit. So after dinner, instead of you know, watching a show together, reading a book together, we, I may have to do a little extra work because i uh, I'm being prepared for, to walk through God doors God opens. Perhaps um, you keep Thursday nights free, so you're ready to invite non-believers over if you have the opportunity. Just kind of building this margin in your life with the expectation that God will put people in your path. So w one example um, of this for me, so every, every Sunday I get one-on-one -on -one time with each of my kids. Um, and so we'll kind of spend some time together, talk about some Bible things. Um, but then with my, with, my, uh, with my daughter, Aaliyah, we've always gone out to a coffee shop and drawn things together. Um, so, 
so but we and we'd always go to this one coffee shop that's open really late so all the saudis go there and uh, i kind of train her to just to sort of say hi to the saudis right she's my secret weapon for meeting saudis um <laughs> And, and what I found is they love kids, and they always give her candy. So she'd just go up to ladies wearing hijabs and would say, are you from Saudi Arabia? And they'd be like, yes! Grab her, kiss her, says, have a candy, right? <laughs> um, so she, she, she loved it, right? And it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for me to disciple my children while, while doing this, right? We, I think we tend to think of kids as a barrier to uh, sharing the gospel, but actually it can be a huge benefit to it. So um, one specific time... Uh, there was this, you know, this guy, uh, you know, looking at her drawings. He says, "Oh, what are you guys drawing?" So oh, she, we're drawing a shark eating a cat. It's like, why? It's like she requested that. It's like, oh, this, it's great. Why? Why? It's like, oh, we, we're, we're, she's my daughter. We do this every Sunday because we want to make sure we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I said, oh, that's really great that you guys do that. What do you do for work? Because I said, oh, I run a nonprofit. We facilitate friendship and conversation between Christian and Muslims. And he says. Oh, you know, I'd, I'd love to learn about that. So we end up getting coffee and I explain the gospel to him. He says, that's beautiful. More on that story in a bit. Um, another time, I ran out of coffee at home, right? And normally on Saturdays, I make coffee at home. This time we'd run out. So I, I sort of said, um, okay, uh, I'm going to go to the store, buy more coffee. But then it's like, do you need anything? It's like, no. Okay, I guess I'll go to Starbucks. Then all my kids want to come. It's like, okay, get your shoes on. So I get my shoes on, which takes me 20 seconds. By the time I get my shoes on, only one wants to come, Aaliyah. Um, four at the time. And we go, we, she, when we get there, she says, Daddy, let's sit down. I'm like, oh, fine. Get a table. So she gets the one table that's free, and there's one chair there. And uh, she, uh, and there's, there's, so there's a woman in a hoodie with headphones next, next to the table. Uh, so I go up and say, hey, excuse me, is this chair free? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I sit down. My four-year-old daughter says, Daddy, make friends. <laughs> Fine. What are you studying? English. Oh, great. Where are you from? Saudi Arabia. <laughs> great. Inti min Saudi. Uh, she says, how do you know Arabic? I said, I run a nonprofit called the Almeida. I, I run a nonprofit. We facilitate friendship and worldview conversations between Christians and Muslims. She says, is that the Almeida Initiative? I've heard of that. I'm like, yes! <laughs> Moving up in the world. Um, she says, I actually have a bunch of questions for you. When can we talk? I was like, all right, let's get coffee. So we got a coffee, uh, coffee a week from then. And so she, she comes to me and she says, okay, so about the Almeida Initiative, are you trying to help people make friends or are you trying to change people's religion? I said, yes. <laughs> and she says, I don't know why you do that. All religions basically teach the same thing. I said, um, okay, I can see why you'd say that. Let me give you an example of why that's not true. So in Islam, you have something called the fitra. And the fitra is this idea that everyone is born in a state of purity. Everyone's born Muslim. And then it's external forces that turn someone into other religions that corrupt people, right? That's what, that's, so that's what Islam teaches. I said that to her. She says, yes, right, that's what, that's, that's what Islam teaches. Jesus, on the other hand, says that nothing outside of a person can make a person unclean. The evil comes out from within a person's heart, and that corrupts a person. Uh, so let me tell you why, let, let me tell you, so I said, let me tell you why this matters, right? So imagine for a moment what Jesus is saying is true, yet you live in a society which teaches you people are basically good. Uh, what would that do to you? Well, you'd look at everyone else and think they basically have it together, but you'd look at yourself and you'd see a darkness that you can't explain, and you'd think you're broken in a way that not everyone else is. And she said, you just described my entire life. So if my heart's the problem, what's the solution? And then I get to explain the gospel to her. Um, so another, another, another crazy one of these things, right, is just from having open eyes. I was giving the notices at church one time. And when, after service, I always try and say hi to new people and greet people I don't recognize. So I, I see this woman leaving who I don't recognize. So I say, hey, I don't think we've met yet. She says, what? I said, we don't know each other. She says, what? I said, we've never met before. She says, no, this is my first time here. Great, what brings you here? I grew up Muslim, decided I didn't believe that anymore, tried being nothing, so now I'm here to try this. <laughs> Great, where are you from? 
Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Great. Which city? You wouldn't have heard of it. Try me. <laughs> okay, it's a town called Katif. I know where that is. I have a friend from there, which means you grew up as a Shia Muslim, right? She's like, how the hell did you know that? <laughs> I have so many questions. When can we talk? <laughs> so we, we, got, we, got, we got coffee later, and... Uh, and so she says, uh, uh, so she asked me, okay, so do you believe the Bible and the Quran, or do you just believe the Bible? I just believe the Bible. I says, okay, um, but if the Quran's not true, how did Jesus escape from the cross? He, he didn't. And so we read the last three chapters of Matthew together, and she says, oh, it does say that he died and rose from the dead, but what actual difference does that make? Okay, so in the Islamic version of things, Allah loved Jesus so much that he rescued him from the cross, right? Yes. In the Bible's version of things, God loved you so much that he put Jesus on the cross, so if you trust in him, you can know with certainty that you're loved and forgiven. She says, that makes so much sense to me. I believe that. <laughs> it's like the easiest conversation I've ever had. <laughs> um... um so again, I didn't do anything to generate that conversation. I just had open eyes and a mindset that God is working. And you'll be, you'll be very surprised and very amazed by what God has in, store for you, has in store for you, right? So there's all sorts of ways to meet Muslims, some within your control, some not at all within your control, and those are the best. Um, next section, right? How to have meaningful conversations with Muslims. Um, so I'm going to break this up into five sections here. The first is uh, listening well. Um, so listening well, right? Um, James 1.19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Proverbs 18.13 says, If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Um, so, so the point here is that we want to make sure that we're understanding who we are actually talking to, right? The last thing I want to do is give you guys a script that you go and repeat to every person you meet, right? Um, it says, hi, uh, I'm James. Great, I'm Saeed. By what standard, Saeed? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, um, being presuppositional is not a script that we get to repeat to people. It's a way of trusting in God's word as the foundation for everything, and it's the foundation of which we explore the world, that we understand the world, that we use to understand the people we're talking to. It's not an excuse to stop learning about worldviews. It's not an excuse to stop learning about people, right? It should embolden that. And if we have that mindset, if we have a mindset with, uh, this, with God's word as a foundation, we're going to see that come out more and more in people's lives, and that's going to give us opportunities to speak. So don't go away from here or anywhere, assuming you know what a Muslim believes. Um, ask questions about what the person you're talking to believes. Try and figure out what their worldview is. Don't assume you know that already. Um, pay attention to the things that make them happy, angry, or sad. Um, Look for unique dreams, virtues, wounds, and sins, right? Because these people are both image bearers of God that reflect him in a way that no one else can. And they're all sinners, but in unique ways, right? Not everybody's sins are going to be the same. Not everyone's virtues are the same. So look uh, for what those things are as you talk with people. Um, and then look for disconnects in people's thinking, right? This is the analogy yesterday of, you know, poking the arms, right? So find ways to poke the arms, but not in a way that's trolling them, in a way that's, um, you know, in a way that's pastoral, in a way that's caring for them, in a way that's trying to help them, right? You're not trying to win the argument. You're trying to, um, you're trying to win the person, although you will often win the argument as you're trying to win the person. Um, so I remember one case, right, that um, I was talking to a girl from Turkmenistan called Mazar, and she, um, so she asked me in the course of our conversations, she actually lived with our family for a while. She asked in the course of our conversations, what do you think the link is between religion and domestic violence? I said, well, it depends what your religion is. So I said, do you think Jesus ever hit a woman? She says, no. 
I, I said, do you think Muhammad ever hit a woman? And she said, I'm sure you're going to tell me he did. It's like, you're right, I am. And I, I read a specific um, hadith where this, this happens. Um, I said, do you think the, the Bible says you can hit a woman? Uh, and she says, I don't know. So I said, well, actually, Peter says, uh, husbands don't even be harsh with your wives on account of your prayers, right? Not only is physical violence excluded, uh, you've got to watch your tone. You've got to watch the way you speak. You've got to make sure you're respectful and gentle in your dealings with your wives, not you know, physical, you know, physical violence is way off the reservation. And, and then I said, do you think that the Quran ever says you can hit a woman? She says, no, but actually it does. So I went to the fourth chapter, Surah An-Nisa, ayah, which is verse 34, which says you, if your wives are, don't listen to you, first put them in separate beds, then speak to them, and then you can uh, beat them, right? And she said, that's sad. So I said, no, Mazar, this is not sad. These are the words of Allah through the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. These aren't sad. These are glorious. He says, no, but it is sad. I said, you're right, it is. And what you're demonstrating at this point is that you have a connection somewhere to a standard that supersedes what you claim to believe. All right, and that is God's standards, not the Quran standards. And you're demonstrating that right now. So a few months you know, went by, and you know, she messaged me saying, "I'm not, I'm not Muslim anymore." So we, so we, 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 and we talk again, and uh, she said, "So I said, well, okay, you're not Muslim. What do you think?" She says, "Yeah, I know, I know, Jesus works for a lot of people, but so does Santa Claus." I'm like, "Come on, you know those are not the same thing." And we talk about some of the historical evidence. She says, "Okay, okay, I guess history is not really my problem. I just don't understand how a parent could do this to their child." talking about the crucifixion it says okay um so let me let me ask you this um let's say there's a gunman in downtown ashgabat turkmenistan about to kill a 40 year old woman and the president of turkmenistan pushes her out the way and takes the bullet himself what would you think about that he says huh two problems solved at once <laughs> <laughs> So I uh, say, so, and then she says, but it would be it would be an honorable end to a dishonorable presidency. I says, okay. So does a parent want their child to do grow up to do honorable things? She says, yeah, okay, fine. It makes sense that God would let Jesus sacrifice Himself for people. That does make sense. Um, just the salvation by faith alone thing doesn't. It just seems too easy to me. Okay, first of all, it wasn't easy for Jesus. Um, secondly. What parent, since you're going to use the family metaphor, what parent, when the newborn is born, do they say, okay, welcome to the world. If you obey all of our rules for your 18 years, then we'll give you our last name. It says, no one. No, you're born into a family, and then your parents help you live in consistency with the family's rules and culture. The same is when you become a Christian, right? You're saved by faith alone, but you're born into the family and then you're helped grow into conformity with that. She says, okay, fine, that makes sense. I just don't feel it. And she, said, and, and she says, don't you just want to slap me right now? Like, why would I want to slap you? She says, when anyone's doing this to me, I want to slap them. Doing what? You know, when somebody knows that I'm right and just keeps arguing with me for the sake of it, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you're saying you know that I'm right and you're just arguing me for the sake of it? And she says, yeah, basically. Like, I know everything you're saying is true. Um, I just have this block, in it, block to it in my heart. It's like, look, so you're acknowledging the truth of Scripture right now that fundamentally it is a heart problem, that we need to be born again is what John 3 says, and that we need God to remove our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, and that's how we're made right with God. It isn't an intellectual thing. You've demonstrated that. Um, that story's still ongoing. Be, be praying for her. Um, so then, then it comes to kind of knowing and communicating the whole counsel of God. Um, so 1 Peter 3 says, Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So, so notice here, you are not 
being asked to understand every single other worldview and every aspect of that, you're being asked to be able to give a defense for what you believe, for the hope in you, right? So it's great to be able to understand Islam. It's great to be able to talk about other people's worldviews. But the most important thing is you keep growing in your ability to understand the scriptures and communicate the scriptures to people. Um, but one thing I found helpful, right, as, as you study the Bible, right, there's, there's questions we ask ourselves, like, what's the, what's the meaning to the original audience? What ways does it point to Jesus? What does this tell us about God? What does it tell us about human nature, right? Uh, how do I apply this, right? All really good questions. Here's a fun one. Um, every time you're reading something, ask, how would I explain this to someone who thinks this is crazy? And, and then maybe God will give you those opportunities. Um, you know, learn how to articulate the gospel. Learn how to explain that to people. Uh, learn to articulate key truths like the Trinity, reliability of the Bible, human nature, salvation. Um, and here's one. Anytime you're asked a question that you don't know, go away and find the answer. If you acknowledge that, no one's going to, you know, no one's going to sort of be like, aha, I got you. You can't answer this question because they have questions they can't answer as well. Either they act like that in the moment it doesn't matter, right? Because you're not just showing them that you know all the answers. You're showing them where your authority is, right? So if they don't know the answers to a question, what they're going to do is they're going to go you know, Google some religious scholars and go through some forums and figure out what do the scholars say about this issue. You're going to go, you're going to study the Bible. You're going to look at what the word of God says and sure, get some counsel and input on that. And you get to share your process with them. So you get to point them to Jesus in your quest for answers from Jesus, right? That's, it's not a bad thing not to know the answer to a question. It's an opportunity for you to learn and grow. And the more growing you do on the battlefield, the easier it is to remember all that stuff. Because you know, if you're reading something academically, you're, you're reading a Bible verse um, that just seems academic to you, um, then you know, it's easy to forget. But you, you share a Bible verse with somebody and it makes them angry at you or weep tears of joy, that's going to stick with you in a level that it's not going to if you're just you're in, in, in a classroom somewhere. Um, and then uh, finally, make sure you watch your footing. Um, this is the presuppositional part of this, right? So it's really, really easy when talking to you know, Muslims to lose track of this, right? So if you're told, somebody tells you the Bible is corrupt, um, you know, it's very easy to sort of uh, say, okay, look how many Greek manuscripts we have. Look, look at how reliable the historical evidence is. And it's useful to know that. That's all good stuff. Um, but unless you yourself are a manuscript scholar who studies the Greek, and well, you know, this is Moscow, Idaho. There may be more of you than average. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, right, generally, you're, you're going to be relying on someone else at that point, right? So, the reason they believe the Bible is corrupt is because a bunch of people in their community have told them that the Bible is corrupt, right? So when you're leaning on other people, um, it's basically a battle between their scholars who they know and love and your scholars who you know and love. And they're always going to pick the people they know and love first, right? So um, I want to give you a framework for talking about things, uh, like talking about the authority of the Bible from the Bible. So... Um, the most recent time I employed this was um, last, about a year ago, um, I got a call from a guy I'd met one time. Um, he's a Pakistani guy. And, he, and, and basically, um, there was a guy who was an Uber driver passenger um, who was Pakistani as well. And he asked the Pakistani Uber driver, oh, you're Pakistani, are you Muslim? And he says, no, I'm Christian. What about you? He says, I'm nothing. Would you like being nothing? Or are you searching? It's like, of course I'm searching, man. I just don't know who to talk to. So the Uber driver gives him my number, and we end up getting coffee. And he says, okay, my first question is, why did Jesus come 2,000 years ago? What happened to all the people that died before Jesus? Like, How would they be right with God? So we read Psalm 49 together, talked about David's hope that God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. And then you know, a week later, he we get together again, and he says, okay, I've been told my whole life the Bible is corrupt. How do you answer that? So I said, okay. So we look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 5. He says that um, 
until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished, right? Jesus affirmed the preservation of the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, my words will not pass away. Uh, in Matthew 23, 34, he said, Jesus says to the people of Israel, therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. What do prophets do? They hear words from God and communicate them. What do scribes do? They accurately write down the words that God has given, right? So Jesus makes a promise to keep speaking through his disciples. Uh, and he promises in John 16 that he's going to send the helper who won't speak on his own authority, but speak on Jesus' behalf to the disciples, right? Um, when we get into the rest of the New Testament in 2 Peter, Peter affirms Paul as scripture. Uh, Paul affirms Luke as scripture in 1 Timothy 5.18. And so we can see within the New Testament, you, you have most of the biblical canon already there. Um, so, so then you can, on, on top of that foundation, then you can turn around and say, now look at all these freaking manuscripts we have too, right? But on a foundation of scripture itself. And then after that, and after that, the Pakistani guy says to me, you know what I appreciate? You didn't just speak from your own mind or from other people. You showed me from the book where this is true. So my question is now, how does a person become a Christian? It's like, okay, well, we read through Romans 10. And uh, he's like, wait, that's it? <laughs> you just, you know, believe in your heart and confess Jesus as Lord? Yeah. Okay, I guess I became a Christian about three days ago. <laughs> um, so, so basically what you're trying to do, right, is you're trying to bring um, the words of God up against the words of men, right? Because, and the more specific you can get, the better. Because it's one thing for a Muslim to say, yeah, the Bible's corrupt. But because they believe there's some truth in it, it's much harder for them to read a specific sentence of Jesus, someone they believe is a prophet, and say, yeah, I don't believe that. God's word is powerful. Let them wrestle with God's word directly. Um, I want to touch on contextualization, um, you know, briefly. There's all sorts of conversations about what words can we use and when. Um, fundamentally, I would argue this is never about relevant. It's about clarity. What we believe is relevant, but you need to be clear, right? So there may be a time you can use a law which is completely clear. There might be a t uh, time we can use a law that it makes things murky, right? We it's to say, yeah, I believe Allah is triune and is the father of Jesus. Or you could say, we both worship Allah in our own way, which makes the waters murky and you should never do that, right? So uh, make sure you're speaking with, with clarity, right? So for example, right, when we say the son of God, uh, Muslims have a problem with that. But the reason they have a problem with that is because they think what we mean is that God hooked up with Mary and spawned a demigod. That's what they think we believe in general, right? So if we, if we talk about Jesus being the son of God, don't hide from the term, but you need to explain the term because they think from their own sources that that's what we believe. They may have also talked to Mormons in this part of the world, right? And that's what they believe. So you know, to be able to say, no, no, that's what the Mormons believe. They've been around for 200 years. That's not what biblical Christianity teaches, is, is important to look for those ways of building clarity about what you're presenting to people. And, and, and thirdly, kind of getting off the script. Um, so when people bring up objections to you, ask good questions like, oh, where did you hear that? Like, why do you ask that question? Uh, why do you think that? So, okay, God, God could not become a man. It's like, oh, okay, why do you think God could not become a man? Like, um, where does that objection come from? Is it just like something that's in you? Is it something you came from reading the Quran? Is it somebody somebody else told you? Where does that objection come from? Make sure you dig deep down into what their objections actually are. Um, bring them face to face with the text of scripture. Um, another thing that's really, really important is take time to explain the narrative of scripture, right? Um, and, and here's why. So Muslims have an idea about the stories of the prophets, but it's not, it's not like an, in a narrative form, it's in like odd stories. Um, can somebody name me like a long narrative-based TV show? Lost, okay. 
So imagine watching season six of Lost, and the way you catch up is by you know watching you know ten assorted clips in no particular order from the previous seasons, right? You wouldn't know what's going on in the plot. Not that you know what's going on in the plot in Lost anyway. Um, it's called that for a reason. Um, but you, but it's. And that's what Islam is like, right? So it has stories about Moses, Abraham, and Jesus, and David, but they have no concept of the chronology and overarching narrative of Scripture. So being able to find the time to explain that narrative to them can be really, really powerful. Um, one thing, as you kind of pursue people, I'd highly recommend offering to pray for people. Um, they'll often say yes to it, and they've often never experienced it before, because Muslims pray their you know, prayers in the mosque, the five daily prayers, and they'll you know, add things that they want alone. But laying your hand on somebody and praying for something specific is just not something they generally experience. And so many times we've prayed for Muslims and they're like, wow, no one's ever done that for me before. I really like that. That's really special. You're gonna, they're going to be experiencing something completely unique from you at that point. And then I, I don't necessarily need to tell you guys this, but so, so often people miss opportunities with Muslims because they, they just want to sort of see the gospel as this sort of booklet of, pre, of prepositions they want to get to, right? And they're looking for an, a, a, a window that a Muslim will kind of give this opening of like, oh, well, you know what can really help with that? There's these four spiritual laws that I can explain to you. Um, instead, right, see a Christianity that encompasses all of life and bring the Bible to bear on as many issues as you have the capability to do. So for example, right, uh, when Kabul fell, uh, we, had, uh, we had a girl reach out to us um, through, through the podcast. We have a podcast, which you can find in, in the booklet, and we talk about various issues in the Muslim world. And we did a couple of episodes um, in, um, on Afghanistan. So we had a bunch of Afghans at us and start reaching out to us. And uh, my friend Ibaz and I met with this girl called uh, Sama, who was... Um, you know, just troubled by everything that happened in her country. So what we did is we read Lamentations about the fall of Jerusalem and the people getting scattered. And we also went through the book of Habakkuk, right? And the book of Habakkuk, uh, he sees all the trouble in his country and says, God, what are you going to do about this? And God says, yeah, I've seen, I'm sending the Babylonians. Like, not that, that's they're worse than us. Uh, and, and so Habakkuk does two things, right? One, it points to the day that the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And secondly, it says, you know, it points back to God's goodness to Israel in the past, right? So it sets up these two things. One, look back at God's goodness in the past, look to God's goodness in the future, and trust him in the midst of chaos of everything falling apart. And we just studied through the whole book with this girl from Afghanistan, and she said, it's just so hard to trust God. And so we say the reason it's hard to trust God is because it's not about trying harder, it's about being transformed. And we walk through John 3, walk through Romans 10. Um, and we prayed with her, and as we're leaving the coffee shop, she takes a picture and says, I, want to, I wanted to take a picture of the place where I found peace. Because we're taking the Bible to bear on as many issues as we have the opportunity to do so. Because it, it, there's, there's so many questions they're asking that the Bible has answers to that most Christians just shy away from because they think it's off the gospel. But... All of it points to the gospel. All of it brings you back to Jesus, and you can bring any Muslim to Jesus through, um, through anything in the Bible if you're willing to uh, take that road. And, and finally, uh, rest in the sovereignty of God. Um, in John 6, Jesus says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. So when you're talking with people, uh, some people are stubborn, some people don't listen to you, um, Remember that it is God who changes hearts and minds, not you, right? Your job is to love your neighbor and speak the truth in love. And, and this is actually something that's really useful. Um, I think we tend to think that reformed theology is something that uh, you know, we're supposed to shy away from with non-believers. But actually, uh, it's one of the secrets to our success is that it's not a secret. We, we just sort of say at the beginning of every event we have, look, as Christians, we believe we have no power to change people's hearts and minds. We believe it's our job to speak the truth in love. And if uh, God changes your mind, that's up to him. It's not up to us. That allows us to be able to have a civil conversation as friends um, 
and, and not get too frustrated with each other that our minds aren't changing because I don't have the power to change your mind. You don't even have the power to change your mind, but God does. And Muslims who I explain that to are like, oh yeah, I really appreciate that outlook. Thank you. Right? That's, that, that, that actually helps the conversation. So you can't change them, so, but God can, so make sure you pray. Make sure you pray for the people you are talking to. Um, and then finally, we have the section, um, welcoming Muslims into the life of the church. Um, so um, what you're going to find in the Muslim community is it's a vast web of in interconnected people. And if you build credibility with one person, you're going to very quickly become friends with their friends as well. And then you have an opportunity to invite your friends into that. Um, so you know, at one point in my life, I had to go to things to meet Muslims. And now I, the opportunities just sort of generate themselves. Once you get in, you're in. And, you can, and things will just sort of keep uh, going and growing. Um, so as far as bringing Muslims to parties and events and stuff, so, so the first thing is you, know, you can invite them into existing things like um, hikes, barbecues, game nights, whatever you have going on. Um, now, so, so a, a hack for this is avoid only serving pork and provide options they can eat, right? It's, you know, I met a guy one time who's, who's like, oh, I'm just gonna start doing ministry to Muslims. So I told my family, we're not gonna eat bacon anymore. It's like, why? It's not like vampires and holy water. Yeah. A, mu a Muslim does not walk into a room, see a plate of bacon and right? they just won't eat it, right? They're not going to feel offended that you have things they can't eat at your party, but they will feel really loved if you make sure you're out, out of your way to provide something they, they can eat, right? It's, it, it, it really isn't that complicated. And even if, you know, even if you go wrong, like the first event a church did um, for Muslims, um, they provided a pork dish as the main thing. <laughs> um, and it was fine. We just got a chicken option. No one cared, right? No one, you know, everyone's laid back about this. It's not going to be a problem. Um, but also, you could actually um, plan sort of specialized events as well. So this Saudi girl that became a Christian, uh, very early on, she wanted to find a way to reach out to the wider Muslim slash Saudi community without having to say too much herself because, you know, it's very, very high stakes in Saudi Arabia. So we were at Red Robin one Sunday after church. And uh, I said, hey, since Ramadan is coming up, we should get all the Christians from Muslim backgrounds together to have kind of a party so you can meet each other and support each other. Somehow she heard, let's get all my Muslim friends and all your Christian friends together and host a dinner at church. And that is not what I said, but I love it. Let's just do it. Uh, so basically during Ramadan, right, which is a, you know, basically a, month, a Muslim sort of religious month where they fast throughout the day and break their fast at 9 p.m., um, you know, if, if you have the event in a mosque, there's going to be like a, you know, a gathered prayer and a sermon to go with it. If you go in someone's house, they don't do that. They just start eating food at sundown, right? So we, we don't do any religious activities for the iftar dinner. We just had a you know, dinner um, after sundown. And we end up having um, 35 Christians and 35 Muslims over for dinner. And the way we approached it is we didn't have any uh, scripted content. We just had little cards in the middle of the table and asked questions like, when did your faith become important to you? Uh, what's the biggest question you have for a Christian or a Muslim? Um, when would be a good time to continue this conversation over coffee? Right, R really simple. And Christians did a great job following up and friendships were built. But um, we found out at this dinner that another one of the Saudis had secretly become a Christian a year earlier. And then the guy that Aliyah and I met in the coffee shop came to this thing. Then from there, he started coming to church every week for 10 weeks. And then a group of us got together and one friend asked him, so what do you think? Do you think we're all crazy? And he says, no, I think I'm going crazy too. <laughs> and, and then at that point, he kind of, uh, moved back to Saudi Arabia the week after that, and we didn't hear from him again for three years. And we had no idea, we had no idea where he was at. Um, but then early last year, he 
shoots me a message and says, hey, are you still in Seattle? I'm here for the weekend. I'm like, yeah, absolutely, let's get coffee. So he asked me how I've been. I tell him all the crazy stuff that's happened to us. And he says, I have a crazy story too. And so what happened is he uh, went back to Saudi Arabia and religion fell off his radar completely, right? Um, gets just forgets about Islam, forgets about Christianity, buries himself in his studies. And then he moves from Jeddah on the West Coast to Dammam on the East Coast after a year to live with his older sister. And as soon as he gets to his older sister's house, a couple of days in, she says, there's something I need to tell you. I've become a Christian and I want you to study the Bible with me. And he's like, okay, I get it. Um, and then he actually, you know, uh, went back to Utah after this to, to study there, gets involved in a Bible-believing church there and gets baptized and is now uh, going strong in his faith. Um, and, and so many more of these uh, opportunities and friendships grew out of these dinners. And so, you know, whenever we think through events, we don't, we're not, the point is not to have a big crowd. The point is consistent one-on-one -on -one relationships between Christians and Muslims where trust can be built, where long, meaningful conversations can be had, and uh, we can see people's lives transformed. Um, so as you plan events, right, as you get ready to invite Muslims to things, um, don't be discouraged if everyone shows up really late, expect it, right? Um, conversely, be prepared to stay late and talk with people. Uh, it's, 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 again, it's an important part of the culture. So, um, you know, we had interns last year and they like to go to bed at like 9 p.m. And I'm like, listen, if you can't stay up till one, you're not gonna make it in Muslim ministry. <laughs> it's, just, it's just, like, it's just not how it works. Um, I, I probably, you know, I've, 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 you know, of uh, you know, nine years of Muslim ministry now, I probably only I can count on one hand the amount of Muslims I've seen before 11 a.m. <laughs> um, it's just how it works. Um, and and then finally, never trust the RSVP. Um, so we we did, we helped a church recently do a dinner for Afghan refugees, uh, and we bought food for 100 people, over 100 people. And the day of, we had uh, six RSVPs for the event. And then you know, we, we go to pick up the Afghan refugees from their hotel and there's supposed to be these you know, six people coming and there's 50 people waiting outside wanting rides, right? <laughs> so we have to do a convoy of ch cars from you know, the church to the, the, the refugee center and we end up having like 80 Afghan refugees by the end of the night. So the RSVP means nothing. Just be prepared to roll with it. It's just, it's just how it goes. Um, and then as you, as you reach out, as you have these relationships, uh, consistency is really, really important. Just by being a consistent presence in people's lives, people will start to come with you, to come to you with, with their issues, right? Because Islam is very much an honor shame based culture. What's great about the Muslim community is that if you, you know, you, if you need a job, if you need some money, if you need like healthcare, you need something like that, the community would do a great job of rallying around you and helping you out. It's great like that. On the other hand, if you have like an existential crisis or depression or some issue that you, you're ashamed to talk about, there's absolutely, no one, there's absolutely no one you can talk to. So I can't tell you how many times Muslims who I don't know very well have come to me saying, hey, I can't talk to anyone in my own community about this, but I know you're religious too and have your own way of dealing with these things. Could you give me your advice on what to do about this thing? And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll share what the Bible says and they'll say, thanks so much, James. You're the only person that I can trust um, because there's so much gossip and um, shame in the communities that they can't talk to each other about this. This is an issue. And by being consistently there for people, you're going to have these opportunities. Um, another reason, another thing to consider here is that um, one misconception a lot of people have is that uh, is that the best people to talk to former Muslim, to Muslims are going to be former Muslims who are now Christians. Um, and this actually poses a specific difficulty. And let me explain why, right? So let's say you're in Bootsas and somebody says, oh, I'm an atheist, right? That doesn't intimidate you at all, right? You're used to dealing with atheists. You, know, you live in the Pacific Northwest, right? You feel fine. Um, now, let's say you're sitting in Bootsas and someone sits down and they say, I'm an atheist and I used to be a Presbyterian pastor. Something different happens in your stomach at that point, right? Whether you react well or not, 
I'm sure you will. But still, there's like a, there's just an extra level of whoa uh, happening there, right? So when a former when a Muslim meets a former Muslim, there's automatically a guard up to who that person is of like, oh, traitor, apostate, right? Whereas with you, they don't have that same category. They're like, okay, look at this unusually moral Westerner, right? They're, they're, they're generally well disposed towards you. Um, so what I found is that I have a chance to be the bridge that former Muslims have a great deal of good to share in this effort, but I, and I get to act as the bridge for those people to come back and interact with their community, not as a former Muslim, but as James's friend, as James's brother in the faith, who happens to understand their situation, right? Their Christian identity can become a bigger part of their identity to this new person through you as a bridge to that. So working together, we can have better conversations. Um, so let's say you want to invite a Muslim to Sunday morning. Uh, how do you do that? So first, give them the freedom to be themselves and ask questions. Don't assume that they feel that liberty already. Because if they go to a mosque, they're not really at liberty to ask questions there. They're not really uh, at liberty to be free. It's very regimented, very structured. So give them the freedom. Say, hey, don't feel like you need to join in with exactly what we're doing. Feel free to kind of observe and, and see what it's like. And if you have any questions about anything, feel free to ask. I wouldn't be offended by any of your questions. Saying that out loud is helpful. Um, communicate that a church is, that church is a people, not a building. Because in Islam, um, a mosque is a building, right? The Islamic religious structure does not work like the Christian structure. Like a mosque is the building. It's a holy place where you go and pray. It's not a holy people who are gathering together, right? Explain the difference. It's really useful for them to know that. Um, and practically, go in with a plan of some other people who they could meet, right? Because I think the issue I run into a lot with it, taking people to church in Seattle is that I bring a non-believing friend and I have this expectation that everyone's gonna come see like, oh, James has an unbelieving friend, has a new friend, I'm gonna go say hi, I'm gonna invite him to lunch, I'm gonna go do all these great things. Maybe that happens automatically here, I don't know. I've already been invited to two meals, thank you. Um, uh, but I would suggest going in with some sort of game plan of who would be good for this person to meet, right? So maybe, you know, maybe they're a computer science student and you know, somebody who works in computer science. Uh, maybe they're, you're really into you know, farming and you know someone who's, uh, you're, uh, who's a farmer, right? Just think of these natural connections that you could make with people. Um, introduce them to your community, not just you. Um, again, take the time to explain what's going on. Why do we sing, right? Muslims don't sing in the mosque, right? So it's actually very strange to them that we sing. Explain that, explain what communion is. Um, and then take the time to break the language barrier. So it's very easy for us to sort of speak in Christianese in ways that people don't understand, but let's say you have Muslim, you're reaching out to Muslims and you use the phrase son of God, right? It's just useful to explain what we mean by son of God um, and make sure we're hitting that and not just assuming everyone knows what we're talking about. Because again, a Muslim would not, a Mormon would not. We need to explain the difference of biblical Christianity. If you're the guy um, putting together uh, the hymns um, and we say, we sing, say, a mighty fortress is our God, right? And we have Lord Sabaoth, his name from age to age, he stands uh, from age to age the same and he must win the battle. You know, you could put an asterisk below saying Lord Sabaoth is a Hebrew term that means Lord of hosts as featured in um, uh, Amos 4.13. Just little things to explain what's going on so somebody from an outside perspective can, 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 uh, can, can get that. Um, so you know, if, you're, if you're leading, you could think that way. Or if you're bringing somebody and um, the, the person preaching, you, know, you just sort of says, son of God, and you know your friend's Muslim, you're like, I'm going to make sure I take time to say, hey, when the pastor says son of God, do you understand what he means by that? Right? Just go in with a mindset of over-communicating, making sure they understand. And, and then finally, um, I want to end with the idea of uh, supporting former Muslims because I want you guys to have good follow through because I believe you're going to see success. Um, Jesus said in Mark 10, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and the gospel 
who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions in the age to come, eternal life. Um, so firstly, prepare to be their new family. Because most Muslims, at least in this generation, who convert from Islam to Christianity are likely to lose everything, right? They're, they're going to be disowned from their family and they're used to having this community of people who every night they're hanging out with and they're talking and suddenly they're moving from six days a week of silence in church on Sunday mornings. We need to prepare to understand this need they have, right? Um, there's going to be relate. There may be relational needs. There may be material needs, right? So let's say um, they come from Pakistan or something and are being supported through school for their family. Perhaps when their family disowns them, they stop receiving money from their home country, and they now have to try and finish school with absolutely nothing. Um, or perhaps their needs are more relational. Like if they're from, say, Saudi Arabia, they become a Christian. They still got a big government scholarship. The government doesn't really care. It's not really paying attention to that but they suddenly have lost their entire circle of friends. Um, so just be aware of these needs as people become believers. Um, and another really important thing here is do not assume that someone comes into the faith as a mature believer. Uh, so I think it's really, really easy for, for us as Christians who you know, live in a place where we've received relatively less persecution until at least recently, um, to think that, okay, somebody from Afghanistan who gets a letter from the Taliban saying, you have to, you have to report to, for an apostasy trial and then you know, leaves the country or faces persecution, is put in jail for their faith, right? We tend to assume that that person comes out uh, mature. Somebody who's really counted the cost must have it all together, and that's not the case. Um, it's the spirit that does that in people, and the spirit instructs us to disciple people, to, to uh, teach people the whole counsel of God, and don't be with the mindset that these people come up matured. Uh, one of the worst things that can happen, it happens repeatedly throughout the history of um, evangelical Christian missions to Muslims, is somebody has a crazy story of coming from radical background, becomes a believer, and then immediately that person's put on stage to share their story. Um, and that breaks, has broken a lot of people, has destroyed a lot of people's lives because there just wasn't that maturity to handle that level of um, public spotlight, right? There, there's a reason there's qualifications for eldership. There's a reason there's a process to become a leader. There's a reason James says not many of you should become teachers. We need to make sure we're patient and not promoting people too quickly and going through a proper discipleship process. Um, this also needs to be a team sport. So if, you're a, if, you, if you have a Muslim friend who becomes a Christian, make sure you're not the only person discipling them. Make sure you're not the only person helping them. Um, it's easy for them to kind of get in that mindset of, yeah, you're the one I trust. I don't trust anyone else. Make sure you're explaining what the local church is. Make sure you're bringing uh, a number of people around you because there's, uh, there's, there's the mindset that can be true in America that we we hear, you know, Jesus said, be fishers of men, right? And when we hear fishers, we think of one guy with a fishing rod casting into the lake, reeling it up, right? Whereas in the New Testament era, like fishermen is like three or four guys walking with a net together, bringing in a group of fish. Evangelism is a team sport. Discipleship is a team sport. Make sure you're working together with others as you uh, disciple people. Um, it's, all, it's very easy when somebody first becomes a Christian to just want to be secretive indefinitely. And your job is to encourage them to live courageously, to not shy away from the conflicts. Now, it's not your time, it's not your place to expose them to their family and say, right, you have two weeks to tell your family you're a Christian, but you need to be encouraging them, persuading them that Christianity is a public declaration of faith in Jesus, and you need to be moving towards that. Um, subsequently, support them in their relationship with their family. Now, that could take a couple of roles. So maybe they really love their family and are really hungry for their family to be saved. And maybe there's a role for you in there where you can go and make friends with their family as well. So the Saudi girl that became a Christian, I actually became really, really good friends with her dad. Um, 
it's to the extent that every time she was in some sort of crisis, he would call me and he would say, James, please help my daughter. Uh, you are like her big brother. I trust you like my own son. Please help her, right? Um, and he was not a believer, um, not yet, uh, but he is, you know, but he trusts me. He, he actually appreciates my role in his daughter's life and love, loves our family too. Um, so don't assume it's going to be all bad. You, ha you have the opportunity to make their family, the mission to their family, part of your mission as well. Um, and, and then also, they may be really angry at their family. They may be, they may be like, you know, my parents disowned me. They've lied to me my whole life. They've kept the truth from me, and I'm really mad at them for it. Uh, and if that's the case, you actually need to help them learn to honor their mother and father and um, pray for those who persecute them and to love their enemies. Uh, and, and don't just give in to, yeah, Islam is bad, therefore your parents are bad, therefore, you know, I'm going to justify this bad attitude I'm seeing towards you. Push them towards biblical Christianity. Um, now, I know this can be can feel difficult uh, because somebody coming from this you know, crazy background, this you know, very difficult culture to come out of, again, it seems like, well, what, what, can I, what do I have to say to a person going through these things? Um, and uh, fundamentally, what... Well, you don't understand what they're going through, but the scriptures do, right? And so you're not giving yourself to the people. You're not giving yourself to former Muslims and to, to, to other believers. You're giving the whole counsel of God. And God's word does equip you to say what needs to be said. It does equip them to live the Christian life and be prepared to grow as a Christian as they reach out to their own community. So stand on God's word as you proclaim the gospel to Muslims, Stand on God's words as you disciple Muslims, and, and you'll do just fine. Um, so thank you guys for your time. Um, if anybody here would like uh, more um, equipping on this, there's, there's a couple of avenues for that for us. So in the booklets, we have a podcast, and this is me having uh, conversations with different Muslims, and form, mostly current Muslims, sometimes former Muslims. Um, some discussions are long and rambling and don't go anywhere, really, and some conversations that are really good. But I'm trying to give people an idea of what it's like to talk to Muslims uh, and different types of Muslims so you can just sort of get the feel of what it's like and how you can have conversations about biblical Christianity with Muslims. Uh, and then if anyone would like more specific training, uh, we have something called Almeida Academy, which is uh, classes we roll out um, a couple of times a year that's starting two weeks from now. Uh, you can sign up on uh, from the link in, in the book that you have. So thank you for the opportunity to speak here and thank you for listening. And um, if, you, if you're interested in following with Muslims, my job isn't just to be an academic guide in this. Um, I wanna help you figure that out. So um, don't hesitate to hit me up. Uh, on the Missions to France table at the back, uh, we have one booklet um, for the Almeida Initiative that you can take with you. Uh, there's Muslims in France, therefore there's an Almeida Initiative booklet on the French uh, booth. Um, so thank you for your time and excited to hear what everyone else has to say.